Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship found on page 741, Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. We are How long, O people, shall my honor suffer shame? But know that the Lord has set apart the righteousness as God's own. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Be angry, but do not sin. Offer right sacrifices. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. you to join us in singing hymn number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory. And I would invite you to stand as you're comfortable.
Good morning. Are there joys or concerns to share with the family this morning? I have a couple. Okay. I don't know if this is a joy or a concern, but as we remember that Dan Craig is in, in New York, uh, let's pray for safe travels for him. And because of that, you're the choir today. So I would ask you to turn to page uh, 473, and after the joys and concerns, be ready to sing that as a choir. And you might put a finger in 454, which will be the response to the prayer. And now my joy. Once again, the Evansville Philharmonic Chorus is going to allow me to sing with them this afternoon at 3.30 at St. Benedict's Cathedral on Lincoln Avenue. We're going to be doing a number of mainly uh, religious hymns, it'll be, or uh, anthems. It'll be just the chorus, not the orchestra this time. This is one of my favorite concerts because we get to show off the chorus a little bit more and not overshadowed by the, by the fine orchestra. I dare say the Evansville Philharmonic Chorus is, is the best Philharmonic Chorus in southwestern Indiana. <laughs> so we'd be happy to see you there this afternoon. I have a concern. My neighbor, Drex McCarthy, who's a cousin to Bruce Wright, is a maintenance man in a coal mine and he had a thousand pound tire fall on his foot, crush every bone, broke his tibia in a couple places, and this is a man who never sits still. And he's gonna need our prayers just to recuperate, to sit still long enough to recuperate. Returning last night about 10 o'clock from a quick business trip to Florida, at the Evansville Airport, apparently it was honor flight day. And seeing all of the people that turned out from our youngest people to our much more experienced in life people, what a great event because it was packed at the airport last night. And I wasn't expecting it, but I waited in line like a good person should and today's a new day. Well, let's gather our hearts and our souls together in prayer.
Gracious and ever-loving God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to catch our breath before another busy week. We give you thanks for the love and the support that we find in this room, in this congregation, in this family. We give you thanks for the music that we share together. And we ask for your blessings on our brother Dan as he is traveling. Give him safe travel. Give him um, a productive trip and bring him home safe. We ask for your blessings on the music in this community, in the broader Evansville area. As we share together in joyous song. We give you thanks for those who have served, for the honor they have received, We ask for your blessing on those who struggle with uh, health concerns, those uh, recent injuries and those long-term illnesses. Give them patience and grace and love. All these things, Lord, and those things that we hold silent in our hearts, we lift to you in the name of Jesus who continues to teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Good morning. Good morning, children. Good morning, congregation. Today, we are going to talk about history. What's that mean, history? We're going to talk about our church's history. What's that mean? History means something that can go back way in the past. Perfect. Something that can go back way in the past. People from the past or things that happened a long time ago. And today we're gonna to talk about our church's history, but countries have history, don't they? Countries have history, and that's really important to a country. For an example, our, our 
country it wasn't the same today as it was back then when we first discovered it. Oh, exactly. <laughs> it isn't the same. Countries have history. That, is, that history is important to the country. Families have history, don't they? People and things that have happened in the past. And today we're going to talk about our church's history. And today we're going to dedicate a special place in our church to tell about our history. We're going to call that place History Hall. And it's the hall that leads to the elevator. We were just down there. And what's on that one wall? What's on that one wall? Cardboard paper. Uh huh. Brown paper. Some of you who came in the back door and up the elevator saw that there's a great big, like this big, there's something very special under that. This week on Wednesday, we had put up there a history timeline. It has a bunch of dates, has a bunch of pictures, it has some words too and it tells our story. After we do the children's moments, we are gonna go out and the children are going to help us remove that covering over the timeline and they get to be the first people to see our timeline. Our timeline is covered now until it is dedicated and blessed, which we're going to do here in just a minute. Now, Miss Rachel is going to lead us in a litany, and the children are going to, a uh, history litany. The children are going to respond, and for the last response, I'll turn and invite the congregation to join us. I think you can remember the response. It is, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> okay? Okay. In 1831, God led the people of this community to build a meeting house, which would be a church, a school, and a community gathering place. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The meeting house is now our chapel. It was built by people of many denominations, and all were welcome to worship there. Ministers from different denominations preached here, and in the early days, Methodist circuit riders on horseback came here regularly. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. About 125 years ago, this church with 13 members became a Methodist church connected to all other Methodist churches across the globe. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Our faith ancestors worked, worshiped in our chapel building, but the church grew until the chapel became too small for the many people who worshiped here each week. Old North built a bigger sanctuary the holy place where we are today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But our chapel building still stands on its original foundation where it was built 192 years ago. It's the oldest public building in Vanderburg County. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Our church's, his, our church's history is testimony to God's faithfulness to the people and to the people's faithfulness to their God. With God's help, we will continue to seek God's will and to spread, the God's, spread God's love to all people, to make disciples of Jesus Christ and for the transformation of the world. And if you'll join the children in the final response. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, Pastor Dan will give us our blessing. Um, okay. <laughs> the history of this church, uh, for some people here, doesn't stretch all the way back to my arrival. There are people who have joined since I've been here. Uh, but the, the history doesn't start when I came here. I've been here almost two years now. Uh, but the history of the church doesn't start with my arrival here. In my mind, it kind of does. That's how I think of Old North. Um, the, but the history 
uh, stretches even beyond before that, this, con this uh, sanctuary and the choice of this color paint precede my arrival here. That happened before I got here. That's part of our history. For some people, that's, that's like as far as our history goes, but it, it stretches back beyond that to when our congregation joined the Methodist Church um, or the Methodist Episcopal Church. And it goes further beyond that, like, like Miss Rachel said, to when it was, it was just a meeting house for the local community. But the, the history doesn't, doesn't begin there. It stretches back to when uh, Methodism arrived in Indiana. And it, it stretches back to the days of Thomas Koch and Francis Asbury, uh, who, who spread Methodism on behalf of John Wesley. John Wesley sort of didn't do very well because he tried to, tried to start uh, Church of England churches here in America at the time of the revolution. So that didn't work very well. So Thomas Koch and Francis Asbury spread his message, his, his, his version of theology uh, across the, 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 certainly the, the eastern part of the United States. But the history of our church doesn't begin there. It, like I say, it started, uh, John Wesley was a, a priest in the Church of England. Uh, he was, he was uh, an ordained uh, Anglican pastor. Uh, but, but the history of our church doesn't start with, with the Episcopal Church, the Church of England, because that was a, a, an offshoot of the Roman Catholic Church, which, was, uh, which stretches all the way back to Jesus Christ. So our, our, the history of our church doesn't just cover uh, what we know. It stretches all the way back to Jesus Christ. But Jesus didn't invent his religion. He was a, he was a faithful Jewish uh, rabbi. And so his, his theology sprang out of the, out of the, the, the Judaism, which came from uh, the, 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 the prophets and the, uh, the, the Torah. Uh, it, it came out of the, the Babylonian exile. So part of our history includes the Babylonian exile. But it doesn't, it doesn't begin there, of course. It, that, uh, the exile involves people who are living in the, the, the nation of Israel, uh, which was founded, you could say, by uh, Saul and David and Solomon. Uh, but, but our history stretches further back than that because they, they were living out of faith uh, as they understood it from Moses. Um, Moses was living a faith that, that sprang out of the faith uh, that, that Abraham first taught. Abraham was, was teaching the faith that Noah first taught, and Noah was teaching the faith that uh, his, his ancestors uh, were teaching. Uh, stretching all the way back to, to the garden, Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam and Eve were living a faith uh, that, was, that was given to them by God Almighty in the beginning when God was creating the heavens and the earth. And so the history of our church, even though we think of it as when Dan got here or mm -hmm. when uh, we built this sanctuary or when this... this uh, uh, the chapel was formed. Our history stretches all the way back to the beginning when God was creating the heavens and the earth. Uh, the earth was formless and void. You guys and girls are a part of that history. You are a part of God's ongoing creation. And someday you'll, you'll pass that history on to the next generation and they will be a part of God's creation. Let's pray together. I'll, I'll say a prayer for us. Dear God, we give you thanks for the history of our, of our church. We know that uh, it stretches all the way back to the beginning because we are people of faith we are people of your blessing. 
We ask you now to bless our history hall. Let it be for us a reminder of the faith that we, uh, that we have shared and uh, that we will one day pass along. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The reading this morning is from the third chapter of Acts, verses 12 through 19. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wander at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by your own power or piety we had made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of your ancestors, has glorified his servant. Jesus, who handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though had decided to release him, but you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith, in his name, his name itself has made his, this man strong, whom he, you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that is Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. This is the word of God for the people of God. I noticed that we don't have the page number for the next part. 880. 880. Some of you have this memorized. I don't. Let's read together uh, the Nicene Creed on page 880. The Gloria, by the way, is on page 70 when we get to that part, but I know you know that. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
Amen. Please rise. be seated. Whatsoever things are beautiful, so beautiful, think on these things. Whatsoever things are honest and true and lovely, think on these things. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, rejoice, rejoice. But in prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God, and peace will always be with you, the peace of God. Whatsoever things are beautiful, so beautiful, think on these things. Whatsoever things are honest and true and lovely, think on these things. These things do and peace unto you. Peace unto you. At this time, I would invite the rest of our offerings.
Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the many blessings you have poured out upon us. And we return a portion of those blessings back to you now for the further service of your church. Amen. One of probably my 400 or 500 favorite hymns, hymn number 140. Great is thy faithfulness. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the uh, first John 3 1 through 7 see what love the Father has given us 
that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. Here ends God, the reading of God's holy words. I have a weird job. My dad used to tease me, as he used to tease his Methodist pastor father, that I only work one hour a week. I know he wasn't serious about it, and so it never really bothered me when he said that. But he said it a lot. My grandfather, his dad, died when I was only five years old. Uh, in fact, it was a month before my sixth birthday. So I don't remember much about him. He was an English immigrant, so I remember he talked funny. But to be honest, that's most of what I remember about him. My dad used to tease him that he only worked an hour a week. And then he used to tease me that I only work an hour a week. I know he was being silly, so I never took it serious. The thing about teasing the pastor, though, is that the pastor always gets the last word. <laughs> I let my dad say that, that I only work one hour a week. I let him go on and on about that. But the fact of the matter is, I always get the last word. I spoke at my dad's funeral, and it only took me about seven minutes I win, Dad. I have a weird job. I have learned over the course of my life that nobody, nobody really needs a pastor until they really need a pastor. When I was a chaplain, that was sort of my, my working philosophy. Nobody really needs a chaplain until they really need a chaplain. And in a, a real sense, it still holds true. Nobody really needs a pastor until they really need a pastor. And the time that most people really need a pastor, even if they've never really needed a pastor before in their life, they need a pastor when it comes time to do a funeral. I've lost count of how many funerals I've done. I used to keep track, but it got a little out of hand. Funerals and weddings are times when I meet lifelong members of the church who I've never heard of before. Nobody really needs a pastor until they really need a pastor. When I participate in a funeral, there are certain parts that always happen. There are readings that take place at every funeral I've ever done. And obviously not every pastor follows the script every time. I, I, I get that. But at every funeral I've ever done, I go pretty much out of the book. I don't know why. I don't do that for other rituals that take place. 
But for funerals and weddings, I tend to pretty much follow the script. And I'm going to show you the script. If you'll take out your hymnal and turn to page 870. It's, it's where we find the, the service of death and resurrection. The beginning of the service starts out with these words, dying Christ destroyed our death. Rising Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. Now I'm not required to follow this exact script, but I typically do. I say these words because they are important to me. As in baptism, this person put on Christ, so in Christ may they be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, and this is the part I want us to focus on this morning. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. These are words that I say at the start of every funeral I've ever done. These words were recited at my dad's funeral. These words have been spoken at every Methodist funeral I've ever attended. One day, some United Methodist pastor will speak these words at my own funeral. You know where these words come from. Behold, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. These are the words written in 1 John chapter 3 about 2,000 years ago. And they were read this morning. Dan, why on earth are you talking to us about funerals? Why in the world do you think we might be interested in the words that are spoken at funerals? I have either attended or participated in more Methodist funerals than, than I can count. In my years of chaplaincy, I attended funerals in all different faith traditions and all different denominations. I was a hospice chaplain, so normally I was going to two or three funerals every single week. But when I attend a funeral at a Methodist church, these words are spoken from 1 John, and, and somehow I draw comfort from that. I know that one day these words will be spoken at my own funeral. Good Lord willing, it'll happen right here in this sanctuary. As in baptism, Dan put on Christ. So in Christ, may he be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. I know it might be uncomfortable to talk about funerals, but really, if we can't talk about it in church, where can we talk about it? And, and I'm not urging anyone to hurry up and get to the funeral part of our relationship. But I like to think that these words will be spoken at my funeral. As in baptism, Dan put on Christ. So in Christ may he be clothed with glory. When I attend a funeral, in a different denomination. They don't say these words. And these aren't magic words. There's no special mystical power that these words carry. But I like them. I like the fact that in our Methodist churches, 
we make mention of the reading from 1 John. Beloved, we are God's children now. There are certain words that we always say at a baptism. There are certain words we always say at a wedding. There are certain words we always say at communion. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. These aren't magic words. It's not an incantation that we recite. But having a certain pattern to our sacred speech, speech can offer some peace. Next week, we're going to be talking about Psalm 23. That's our sermon text for next week. Now, Psalm 23 is another scripture that we typically read at a funeral. It just feels right to have a certain pattern to our rituals. And in a Methodist funeral, the first words are these from 1 John. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Those words are so connected to our funeral rituals that it almost feels awkward to read them in a, a normal worship service. But talking about them today, now in this normal worship service, reminds us that from birth to death, our lives are cradled in God's holy words in the scriptures. Talking about them this morning feels awkward, at least for me, maybe I'm the only one. But talking about them also offers us the assurance that whether in life or in death, God's compassion still goes on. And it's interesting and a little bit poignant that we talk about these words on the day that we dedicate the History Hall. Because history is made up of the lives that have brought us here. History is a tribute to the people who have accomplished the achievements of Old North United Methodist Church. The flowers out in front of the chapel, somebody pointed out this morning, were planted by someone who is now gone. In honoring the past, in remembering that all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure, we gain the strength necessary to carry on. Our history is vast, but our hope is narrow. Our hope is focused. And we say these words not because they're written in the hymnal, but because they are holy. We say them because they are true. We say them because these are God's holy words. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. This feels like an awkward but very comforting assurance. This feels like glory. Let's sing together. Before we sing the closing hymn, you might want to put your finger on hymn number 557 that we will sing as a benediction response at the end. This closing hymn, I was told by a college friend even before his death, nearly, well, just over 56 years ago was one of Martin Luther King's favorite hymns. I think the message is good for us to pray as well. Hymn number 474, now again I would ask you to stand as able. Precious Lord, take my hand.
precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on. Precious Lord, lead me home. When the way grows dim, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the There's a, a TV show, it's no longer on, but it, it was on for several years, called The Office. It's a, a comedy. Uh, one of my favorite lines is uh, a guy named Andy says, I wish there was a way to know uh, you're in the good old days before, um, while well, you're still in them or something like that. I messed it up. It's, it's interesting to think we are the history of Old North. Uh, the time is going to come when people are going to look back on, on this congregation this morning, April 14th, and say, this is the day they dedicated the, the history hall. That was the good old days. I wish there was a way for us to know we are in the good old days. Go forth now into your homes, into your community, into your workplaces, on all the places you gather, to proclaim and to be the love of God. May you continue to be created. May you continue to be redeemed. May you continue to be sustained and nourished and blessed and held and loved 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 by God Almighty. And may peace abide among you. Amen. Blessed be the tie that